Sometimes people request movies that I just sit back and think, like, how the hell have I not reviewed this film yet? Like, how did that happen? A film like Starry Eyes that I'm such an enormous fan of, that I have a fucking frame poster of that I hung on my wall for a very long time until I ran out of places to put things. I have no posters in this whole place because I couldn't fit any if I tried. Um, But I still do have that framed poster somewhere over there. And yeah, I mean, I always say that if I have a framed poster on my wall of a movie, that means I love that film. Like there's so many films I really enjoy or love. So when it came down time to put some posters up on the wall and I wanted to get like framed ones and do it good, like I was like, all right, I'm picking like my favorite films of like the new and the old. And Starry Eyes was just like one of the first ones that jumped out to me. I was like, I want a Starry Eyes poster. I love this film. So this was a patron request by Bert Lozano. And uh, <clears throat> this stars Alex Essos, um, who gives an incredibly wonderful performance here. And I feel like she just carries the entire film. Like, there's plenty... Now, granted the main focus is on this girl and she probably you know takes up 75 80 percent of the dialogue and screen time and everything so this film relies on her to carry the film and she does so so i don't want to say like oh well she carries it and like everyone else sucks or like you know because that's just not the case like i think everyone else in the movie is good it's just that it so much is reliant on her performance and I think she nails it without her performance this movie's terrible but you have a bad performance here forget it (laughs) forget it'd be a terrible movie so um and that's not the case with every film that's just not the case with every film I've seen movies where people have given terrible performances and I'm like oh it was a good movie I still enjoyed it I didn't care I mean Look at a few Nicolas Cage movies, for instance. Anyway, um, all right. So we've also got Pat Healy in here who plays the manager of this uh, Tots place she works. Uh, Like um, Big Tots? I think Big Tots, the name of the place. And then they call the kids Tater Tots. and um, Big Tots? Is that what the, the place is called? Anyway, so he's the manager there. And then you got Mark Sentner in here. Now, Mark Sentner is a guy that I am a huge fan of. He's one of my, if not my favorite, unknown actor. Just his performance as Ray Pye in The Lost Alone got me some uh, serious love for the guy. But then also, and there's a few other films, but also a film that he did with Amanda Fuller, who's also in this movie called Red, White, and Blue by Simon Rumley, who if you haven't seen that fucking film, man, you have got to do yourself a favor. That film is phenomenal. Just phenomenal. That's one of those hidden gem movies that, you know, you just want to recommend to to feel cool, to look cool. Because the film's just so damn good. It's really dark and depressing. Um, But it's just such a, it's such a great film. Um, and Mark Center and uh, Amanda Fuller are some of the main characters in the movie. Um, and I just, I can't recommend that movie high enough. But seeing them together in this film. Now, Amanda Fuller, holy shit, has that woman let herself go? Jesus Christ, I saw her in like the second to last season or the last season of Orange is the New Black. And it was like, I was looking at her because she's like super overweight and she's like, her teeth are all fucked up. And I was like, it's like, how the fuck do I know this girl? I'm like looking at her and I'm like, I know I know this girl, you know? And he just kept looking at her. It was like this, it was like, I was like, I don't think, how do I know this girl? And, you know, I looked it up and it was like, oh my God, that's the girl from Red, White, and Blue. That's Amanda Fuller. Holy shit, does she look awful. She gains so much weight and she just, but now granted, in that show, she was supposed to look trashy. She was supposed to look God awful. So, you know, they made her under, but she still was considerably overweight. So, yeah, she, wow, she, uh, yeah, did not um, fare well later on. All right, so uh, in this movie, we have Sarah Walker, and she 
is wanting to be a starlet, right? She wants to be the next big thing in Hollywood like most people in Southern California. Um, and if you want to find anyone who is an actor, just walk into pretty much any restaurant in the place and talk to a waiter and nine times out of 10, you're gonna be talking to an actor or a writer. Um, so it is fitting that she works at some uh, Hooters type uh, establishment and she is, of course, trying to get her career up off the ground in the acting business. Uh, there is some stuff in here that's fairly reminiscent of La La Land. I feel like Sarah uh, shares a, like some similarities with Mia's character in just in her auditions and how they go and this and that. Now, of course, I don't think that has anything to do with each other. Like, I don't think that Damien Chazel watched this movie and was like, oh yeah, like I'm going to steal from there. Even though he's a horror, um, he has some horror roots and he's, and he's a fan of the genre. It's just, I think that that's just kind of how it is. Like, I think the reason why it's like that in this movie and why it's like that in the other movie is because that's, I mean, this is just kind of spot on on what it's like to just go into the, I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't do it. It would just be humiliating to me. I think in order to be an actor, you have to have such a sense of humility. Like you have to just let it go. You don't give a fuck what anybody thinks about like how stupid you may look, how whatever, like you have got to be that go-getter who just doesn't actually care what people think outside of, of course you want to think, they, you want them to think you're good, but there can be some demeaning things. There can be some, um, you know, some dialogue that seems stupid, whatever. And you're just sitting there and you have to just not really care. <laughs> and I just, I don't know if I'd be capable to, no, I can tell you, I, I just couldn't do it. So when they go in there and La La Land has a really, really terrible depiction of this. When I say terrible, I mean, I don't mean like terrible as in the film. I mean, just her interaction in that where, she, where Mia goes in and she's talking to them and, She's like giving this amazing, deep, you know, fucking sad performance where she's like breaking down and crying and she's giving it her soul. And then somebody just comes in and interrupts it and is just like, they just go and she's just supposed to sit there and hold the phone and be like in the moment. And she's just like waiting and she's waiting. And then they just, you know, they leave them like, okay, where were you? Go ahead. And she's like supposed to just what break back into it and start crying and get on the like get the fuck out of here like that scene is so cringy because you know that kind of shit happens and same thing here it's just like you know she goes in and just the way they talk to you and the way that they're just filming you and it's just this it's so impersonal like I get that that's the gig and whatever and, and I'm not saying that there's a better way to do it because I'm not sure I don't know I mean they do it like that for a reason I guess you can't be afraid you can't be shy you can't this and that they don't want to get on a production and here's a person who can't act in front of a you know a big group of people who has um, you know is, is worried about what people think whatever I, I get it it's just fuck fuck seeing me in there that's all i'm saying i do think like there might not be a better way to handle it per se but like coming in on a girl's performance like that while she's like in the middle of crying and when she's really giving it her all when you know for sure that, that pretty much every person in there is like that's their that's their soul they're laying on the line they want this so bad and just to interrupt somebody like that is evil as fuck <laughs> so there might not be a better way to do that, like it overall, but something like that. It's like, really? Come on, guys. Um, but now she goes in, she messes up, she gives herself some serious, you know, um, self harm here. And this, now I never go to this extent where I'm yanking my hair out of my head or whatnot, but I'm definitely guilty of being a the hardest person on me by far like no one's harder on me than me and also i've definitely physically abused myself not to that extent like i've never cut myself or done anything that's like permanent or you know crazy i've hit myself for sure i've like punched myself slapped myself like 
like when I'm really, really disappointed. And sometimes it's like in the dumbest moments, like playing a video game or something where I'm just like so in it and I make some dumb decision and it costs my team the game or something and I just like get so mad and I like punch myself in the face. It's happened like once or twice in my life and I just do, as soon as I do it, I'm so filled with anger, I'm so angry at myself and, and I do it and then I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing? What, are you, what the hell's wrong with you, you know? Um, of course, that's kind of mellowed out more as I've gotten older as far as like the, the self-harm in that way. But like when I see her doing this and this, it's it's sad to watch. Like some people wouldn't get it at all. And, and they'll be like, what the fuck? Oh my God, I never hurt myself. Well, you're not them. You know, you're not me. You're not her. And, uh, you know, you might not be able to relate, but, you know, there are people out there like that. I dated a girl who had fucking a thousand scars and when i say a thousand i legit mean a thousand scars across her arm like she just cut herself cut herself cut herself cut herself cut herself like so many times over her life and there was some on her legs and everything and back then i was like in my early 20s i was drinking all the time i was party central i was just like oh you know i liked the i liked the crazy ones i liked i liked the wild ones and i met her and i just thought she was edgy and cool and whatever you know nowadays i saw that shit i'd be gone i'd be like what the fuck absolutely not i'm not bringing that shit around my kids i don't need that in my life like i don't need nothing like that that's craziness and this would be this woman actually became like a homeless fucking beggar vagrant like screaming at cars as they were driving past like obscenities and such and was like just certifiably crazy like she completely lost it i mean shocker right but just to see this girl like beat herself up after it's, it's sad it is sad and her performance here is just so raw and so real and it's just so you know devastating like throughout the whole thing i just feel so bad for this girl like there's there's something so she's so like mm, i want to say i was gonna say the word pathetic but I don't want to say pathetic because I don't think that would be the right the right description here. Like in the film, she desperately want like we can't deny that this is for sure her dream. Like the, like what's something you want more than anything, and you're willing to do pretty much anything to get it. What's your thing? You know, like. I feel like not that many people have that firm of a stance on something like that, like where they want something that bad. And throughout this, like I think she wants it that bad and she's able to put herself out there and this and that, but she does feel very frail and very weak. Even though she's able to go up and, and do things that I myself wouldn't be able to do just because I would feel humiliated and whatnot. Just everything else in the film, she just feels like this, you know, starry-eyed, <laughs> um, like doe in a headlights kind of thing, where she's just so like, pathetic keeps coming to my mind, but it's not pathetic. I don't think she's pathetic in this film. She's just a sad character. And she just wants this so badly, and it's it, it it it's it's a tragic film, man. It really is. It's sad to watch this girl fall apart like that. But she wants this, you know, and the length she goes to get it. Now, I guess my question here would be: Is she like? Is she? compromise so much that her actions in this film as time goes on after her you know uh, her first audition and everything because that's where her like the very first um indications of her transformation are coming from is just that first audition she comes home that girl breaks her nose and she just lets a laugh out like <laughs> that's funny like that's funny that girl just got injured and Amanda Fuller's character looks over and like, what the, what the fuck? What are you laughing at? Like, do you see what happened to this girl? It's not funny at all. So there's a there's a pretty much an immediate change in her. Almost as if the 
transformation that happens at the end of this movie starts that early on. Because essentially, I mean, I, this film, I don't think it's really trying to hide the fact that it's basically a metaphor for what it, it what it is like and what it takes to become a star. Like you basically got to, you know, leave your former life behind, leave your former self behind, leave everyone you know behind, basically cut ties to everyone, um, kill the past. And so in this movie, it's just her sacrificing absolutely everything, including her own self. <clears throat> it's like Hollywood demands you to sell your soul, to stop being who you are, to stop talking to who you know, to be part of their club. One of us, one of us, you know. And that's, I feel like that's just, that's pretty prevalent throughout the entire thing. And just the sh like the cattiness and the shallowness of these characters, especially that uh, real cute chick who's banging the director at the end and gets herself fucking <clears throat> she gets knifed. Um, you know she is god awful in this movie. Like she <laughs> she just has all these catty ass responses where she's like constantly demeaning and belittling everything that Sarah's you know possibly achieving like oh you really think you're gonna get it and, oh I hope that's a working title and all these really passive aggressive shitty ass comments you just want to smash this fucking girl and you know in both ways I mean she's a very attractive girl but you're, it's a character you want dead you're just like oh my god in a horror movie you're like please make this one of the people that gets killed and uh pretty much everyone we meet in the film that she knows gets killed by her um but yeah i, I guess i just have to ask and question how much of her actions was she responsible for that's where i'm iffy that's where i'm like 50 50 on the movie like, was Sarah in control fully? Because she's, we see that she's, like, physically compromised. Like, she's clearly, you know, having some body horror going on in here where her hair's falling out, she's getting scabs and, you know, shit all over her face and her body. So, like, yeah, that is out of her control for sure. But are her actions out of her control and is her mental state out of her control or is she just feel desperate and she feels like she's already so far in she might as well take it to the next level and the fact that her friends are betraying her anyway and she doesn't really like any of them besides Amanda Fuller's character her roommate who she doesn't kill in that massacre so like by that point is she like is she fully aware of her actions is she fully committed to this has she has she sold in like has she bought in has she sold her soul completely at that point and she's just you know acting purely out of desire like i want to be part of this like i've already taken it this far let's take it you know the the full fucking the full length so that i don't know i don't know because there's a transformation happening and because she's pretty much like I don't feel like there's anything left of her in the end like when she's reborn and she comes out and she's got the green eyes and all that shit that's not the Sarah at the beginning of the movie and when I say that that's I mean it's like, oh obviously it's not no I mean like that's not the Sarah that we met at the beginning of the movie like that person is dead the person that they buried is dead and the person who emerges is a completely different person. Like I think she might have some of her memories or something, but I there's I don't think there's any of Sarah left in there at the end of this film. I don't see any indications. I don't see anything to suggest that Sarah still li exists. Like I think whoever took her over is able to draw from her memory you know, to have that relationship with her roommate, whatever, so she can talk to her and, and lure her in and all that. But I just, I don't see. So that being said, if I am accurate on that, 
then was it a slow transformation, which that's her body's, you know, deteriorating and everything. Is her mind, is her ability to control her actions also deteriorating with that? I would have to go with yes. I don't think that she's fully to blame here. I don't think she's fully in control. She's definitely not fully out of control, though. Like, you can tell there's still anger in her. You can tell that the that the, that the bias and the, you know, the revenge and all that stuff, that's powered by who she was, you know, before this. And I just, yeah, so, so I think that, yeah, I'm going to stick with, you know, she was compromised, but not to the extent where she was, you know, completely void now the directors of this movie I forgot to even add are the guys who ended up doing that fucking dreadful Pet Cemetery reimagination readaptation whatever you want to call it when I saw that it was them doing it because I'm not a big Pet Cemetery fan and I love Pet Cemetery too and I was like okay maybe they can remake it and maybe I'll like it this time it's the starry eyes people Oh my God, was that bland, generic garbage. I was like, what the fuck am I watching? How is this the starry eye guys? Which of course I just make, or is it, are they both guys? Kevin and Dennis, yeah. Um, Like how the fuck are they, how'd they make that movie and this movie? I don't know, I don't get it. Now I think you have to like, I think you have to like and, and like sympathize with this main character here to like the movie if you don't i don't think i can't see you enjoying much of this movie at all um outside of like you know a couple kills most notably the hand weight kill which is the best one in the movie by far like that kill is gnarly great kill man just brutal brutal the rest of the kills in this movie are fine the brutality of it and the emotion behind it. Like how it's happening, when it's happening, who it's happening to, all that does work. But the Hanway kill is the only great kill in the film. Which is kind of a downside of the movie. Like, I couldn't give it a 10 out of 10 because of that. Like, I feel like all the deaths in this movie should have been as shocking as the Hanway death. Like stabbing in the back of somebody and this and that as they cry out and this and that. Yeah, okay. That's horrifying like on the surface but to us horror fans like we want to see brutality we want to see hand weight kills like that where heads completely smash and cave in and you just keep showing it and it's just gratuitous like give me that shit give me that on every one of these kills and this movie would be even better so it's kind of a shame um oh it's such a demeaning scene when she has to uh, beg for her job back at that tots place oh oh and the way he says it and all this stuff he says it. pat plays his role so so well um and <clears throat> yeah i like how she takes drugs and that's what lures her back she's like on drugs and she's just like fuck it <laughs> like i'm gonna go suck that guy's dick i want it i want this so bad i'll do it does his cum have like transformative powers in it because it seems like after she does that that's when she's like throwing up and and changing and spewing things like i'm like is this guy like the devil and he's like just you know shooting some kind of fucking um transformative thing down her throat <laughs> I was like, what is this? This is crazy. Um, Oh my God. They make her look like shit in this. Holy God. And what the hell is coming out of her vagina? Like there's like, it's like bloody mucus or something when she reaches down there and it's all blue. So gross, man. So, so gross. And then she vomits up worms like she's dead already. Nuts. Uh, then he calls her up and he's like, did you expect it to be easy? Yikes. Uh, oh, when she cuts that girl's face, that's a good cut. It's like just bull, just 
pouring, pouring blood. It's brutal. Um, blood in, like when someone puts a bag over somebody's head and blood like comes out in the bag as they're strangling them, even though that kill in itself is really not that gruesome, um, putting blood in the bag when you do it elevates those kills exponentially every single time every single time i've ever seen a movie where they put a bag over someone's head and then they're spitting up blood inside the bag and the blood is like spraying all, like all over the face usually blood doesn't do anything for me in movies i'm like eh, it's just blood but for some reason blood in a bag when they're pushing it against the face and the blood blood's just filling up in the bag and they're like coughing and choking on their own blood in the back it just adds to the absolute violence of that sequence so love to see it here um and <clears throat> i like when she's when she's like i don't have any friends like she's so detached from everything by this point like she's totally bought it, bought in she is dedicated we can definitely agree on that then she's uh, yeah then she's reborn and we get to see her amazing rack wow what a great pair of tits. I'm so I thought for sure with this at with this actress when she was in the earlier stages in the film. But that's just it. She's so reserved. She's so like timid in the in the opening sequences that when you don't see her naked, you're like, Oh, well she this is just the actress she doesn't want to be seen naked, but it's actually like a character thing. Like where she's you know, she's not even sexualized. She's not she's not even like she's not even presented as a like, fucking, you know, a full grown woman at times. Like she just feels like a little kid at times. But then as she's like transformed, she becomes this, you know, this monstrous character in the end that's just not worried about any of these things and, you know, is fully um <clears throat> fully herself. She comes out and she's just like naked and she's like playing with herself in the mirror and her friend comes in and she pulls off the cover and you just see her naked for like five minutes, man, and it's wonderful. She's a fantastic body. Um but yeah, her her green eyes that are like glimmering and and then she just kisses her friend to death. Eh, that kills pretty lame, to be honest. And the music, oh, the music is great, man. And then you get like the one of us kind of chant and everything. And that's how it ends. Um, now, Alex Esso actually played Wendy Torrance in the uh, Doctor Sleep uh, sequel to The Shining. And she, you know, she redid the scenes of... Uh, you know of the of the original 1980 Kubrick version and man she nailed that role dude Shelley Duvall she was like her like it was wild to watch I was like holy shit she's got her mannerism she's got everything down her performance in that is phenomenal even though she's not in it much it was like just rewatching The Shining like those sequences wild so great, great performance for her by her in the very little time she got there. I hope she gets more roles. Um, but starry eyes, man. So Bert, thank you. Hopefully that was good. I stumbled here and there as usual. But, um, you know, typical review. That's that's what you guys are here for. If you gave money to my channel, you must like what I'm doing. So I appreciate it. Patreon.com, you know, you know the gig. All right, let me know. Bye.